14 nanometer. Whether it be the classic lithographic node or one of its plus derivatives, the once mighty and power efficient node is now more or less a meme in the tech community. It's come to represent Intel's lack of innovation, but is also still very technically impressive. The last generation of chips to be built on 14 nanometer was Rocket Lake, which sported a 6 core i5 and an 8 core i7 and i9. It's because of the nearly identical core layout, the i7-11700K presents itself as a cheaper $350 alternative to the i9-11900K. The only thing you lose by going with the i7 is clock speed. So if we've got 8 cores and 16 threads, how does this compare to Coffee Lake's i9-9900K in terms of performance, specs, and power efficiency? Before we get into this video, I'd like to take a moment to say not to forget to leave a like and subscribe, and comment if there's something you think I missed in this video. If there's a game that you want included in the benchmark suite, then commenting or joining the community discord is one of the best ways to get in touch. Now without any further ado, let's dive into the i7-11700K. Let's start our look at the i7-11700K with a dive under the hood. Rocking 8 hyper-threaded Cypress Cove cores, the microarchitecture in this chip is actually a derivative of the 10 nanometer designed Sunny Cove core. Some features have been removed though, so it's not an exact one-to-one -one port, but functionally the cores are nearly identical, with clock speed and instruction support being the only differences between the two designs. This marks an evolution over the previous generation Skylake though, and in terms of IPC we get all the upgrades brought on by Sunny Cove, including the new Gen 12Z integrated graphics. Execution port count is the same, with 10 per core, as well as the expanded cache and decode structures. The chip itself is socketed in the generation old LGA1200, which while compatible with the same boards as Comet Lake, requires a BIOS update similar to the Coffee Lake R chips. To get the most from your 11700K though, I'd recommend either a high-end Z490 or really any Z590 board, especially if you want lots of M.2 expansion slots. In fact, Intel specifically designed in an extra 4 PCIe 4.0 lanes on Rocket Lake, meaning you can run a single M.2 drive with a full by 16 connection for your GPU. The actual speeds for the M.2 slots will depend on the motherboard you pick up, and if you want to take advantage of the PCIe 4.0 lanes, then Z590 is the safest bet. Connectivity for this chip is excellent and is a nice upgrade from Skylake's now kind of old PCIe 3.0 base lanes. It leaves room open for upgrading your NVMe SSD, or if you're like me, it allows for full bandwidth to your graphics card if you've got tons of M.2 drives. The platform also sports a Foxville Ethernet controller, meaning we get 2.5 gigabit speeds for a wired connection. This specific board lacks wireless though, which is something I'm personally fine without. But you would theoretically get faster speeds if you use a PCIe wireless adapter due to PCIe 4.0. Moving into the cache pipeline, an all Rocket Lake chip sport 80 kilobytes of total L1 cache per core. This means this chip contains more total L1 cache than the previous generation's Skylake cores. This allows for more instructions and data to be stored inside the CPU, meaning it's physically closer to where it will be processed. Now an increase in L1 cache size doesn't automatically mean more performance, but the increased L2 cache size of 512 kilobytes per core combined with the wider execution pipeline means the chip is able to feed the beast more effectively. Latencies on this cache, however, are higher than what's found on Skylake, and this is due to the physical size of said caches. It takes longer to search through a larger cache, and if you want an analogy, imagine you have a filing cabinet. The larger the cabinet, the more you're able to store at any given time. But it also comes with the drawback of a potentially longer search since there's more stuff you have to sift through due to the volume of documents. The difference between a CPU and our analogy though is the time frame that this occurs. Inside a CPU this happens in nanoseconds, but if you think of things in terms of clock cycles, an increase in latency means the ALU is sitting unoccupied for some time, leaving a gap that could potentially be used on other computations. In real world use cases though, you won't be able to notice latencies this small unless you're benchmarking the chip, but it's still there and affects performance. Moving to the L3 cache though, and the 11700K rocks 16 megabytes on 16 lanes. When comparing to the i7-10700K and the i9-9900K, this L3 cache structure looks very similar between the three chips. 
However, given the advances in L1 and L2 cache, the 11700K has more total on-die cache than either of the two previously mentioned chips. The 11700K is also able to fill its instruction caches more effectively thanks to the 5-lane decoder found within each core. While this is still behind the 8-lane decoder found in Apple's M1 chip, this is a step up above what AMD offers in their Zen 3 parts, being kept at 4 lanes for their specific decode blocks. This enables more parallelism with instruction decoding and micro-op dispatching, and when combined with the additional load store units found in Cypress Cove, the chip is able to operate on memory in a more parallel manner, ultimately leading to a wider pipeline for filling and modifying the cache and onboard memory. It's one of those little changes that can lead to big performance improvements. Integrated graphics available on here aren't anything to write home about, but if you're interested in the new Z32 execution unit parts, I can make a separate video exploring that side of the equation. If an iGPU isn't the biggest deal, then I'd recommend checking out the i7-11700KF. It's a nice way to save money, but also comes with the downside of not having a useful troubleshooting feature. This is also kind of related to AVX512, as if you're looking to do some parallel or vectorized programming on this chip, you're 100% able to thanks to the support of AVX512 Foundation and the inclusion of a DirectX and OpenCL compatible iGPU, which you would lose with the purchase of a KF chip. Let's talk power consumption though, and this is where things get a little complicated. Going on the spec sheet provided by Intel, this chip has a rated TDP of 125 watts, but in practice we're looking at more around 220 watts of total power draw when the chip is stressed. Compared to last generation's 10700K, the power draw seems to be slipping its way way above the 200 watt mark, meaning you'll need a solid cooler if you're eyeing one of these chips. I personally use a 240mm AIO, and at times temperatures can get a bit toasty. A majority of the time though, temperatures never exceed 60 Celsius, but when they do, things get up to 85 Celsius easily under a render workload. Clock speeds, which rely on both thermals and power, come in at 3.6 GHz all-core base and 5 GHz single-core turbo. This sounds eerily similar to the i9-9900K, and for all intents and purposes, this chip behaves like one in an overclocking sense. I enabled multi-core enhancement in the BIOS and also overclocked my chip to 5 GHz all-core. This could explain why my 11700K runs so warm, but when we get to the benchmarks, you'll see why I like to keep my chip this way. Speaking of benchmarks, let's dive into our test system, and see what we've got to work with. Starting with our base platform, we've got a Gigabyte Z590 Ultra Durable Motherboard, rocking a beyond capable power delivery system along with the overclocking friendly Z590 chipset. This will allow us to overclock our chip decently, but keep in mind that it's also compatible with cheaper B560 boards. If you don't plan on overclocking, then I'd recommend one of those, but if you do plan on overclocking, I'd recommend a Z490 or Z590. We've also got 32 gigs of 3200 megatransfers per second CL16 DDR4 provided by TimeTech. We've got some of their cool looking Pinnacle MM1 conduit modules in house, and if you're interested in checking out some of their memory, check out the links in the video description below. For our GPU, we've got the Titan X Pascal, a beyond capable 1440p and light 4K card that matches the RTX 3060 and FP32, but stomps it in int32. It's got 12 gigs of GDDR5X, so we shouldn't have any problems maxing out the CPU at 1080p low settings. All of our games will be run off my Samsung 860 Cuvo and Crucial P2 1TB to help keep storage bottlenecks from hampering our CPU. Without any further ado, let's dive into the benchmarks and see how this 16-threaded chip shreds through games. Let's start with Cinebench R20, and with our 5GHz all-core overclock, the benchmark returned a score of 5,970. For comparison, the i9-9900K scored 4965 points, meaning the single-threaded power improved to the point where the 11700K is able to score almost 1,000 points higher with similar specs. This score mostly translates to productivity-like tasks, such as rendering a blender scene or having multiple apps open at once, and is less indicative of an improvement in games. Let's dig in a bit further. Starting our look at gaming with Apex Legends, and honestly both our 9900K and 11700K delivered identical performance. The game has a 144 FPS cap, and both chips sustained it for a majority of the playtime. Arc Survival Evolve showed a large 22.5% lead in favor of the 11700K, with the minimum showing an even more enormous lead in favor of the i7. 
The single-threaded gains with Cypress Cove really get to stretch their legs in this game, and show off the generational performance improvements. Battlefield 1, similar to Apex Legends, maxed out the engine framerate cap, coming in at 200 FPS average on the 11700K, and 187 FPS average on the 9900K. These chips are both so powerful that it's almost to the point where it doesn't really matter which chip you buy as they're both beyond competent, especially in Frostbite games. Battlefront 2, another game that I tested but didn't include, ran very similarly to Battlefield, which is why I can the benchmark. Having repeated performance just seemed redundant. Call of Duty Vanguard, a game I've personally been having a lot of fun playing, showed minor but measurable improvements on the 11700K. While playing, this is most notable instability of your frame rate, with the micro stutter being almost completely eliminated on the newer chip. Both the i9 and i7 performed very similarly though, so if you plan on picking up one of these chips to play some Vanguard, just get whichever one is cheaper. CSGO, a notoriously CPU-bound game, shows an improvement upon the success of the i9-9900K, with the 11700K finally providing the first major performance improvement in this game since the 6th generation of core parts. Admittedly, the i5-11400 provides nearly identical performance in this game as the 11700K due to the lack of multi-threaded processing. So if you want the Cypress Cove improvements in CSGO, I'd recommend one of the cheaper i5 parts as it delivers nearly identical performance. Our next game, Cyberpunk 2077, shows a large improvement on the part of the 11700K, probably thanks to the single-threaded improvements of Cypress Cove. The 16 threads also help both chips power through this rather tough workload, with both chips providing a similar class of performance. I would personally take the 11700K over the 9900K, but I would be satisfied with the older and probably cheaper part as well. Doom Eternal, a game that scales very well on all hardware and is notoriously GPU bound, delivered an enormous 35% improvement on the 11700K. This is kind of suspicious, but when looking at the hardware of the 11700K, it technically rocks 25% more total execution ports over the 9900K, but I suspect something strange is afoot. Up next is Far Cry 5, and at our test settings and resolution, the 11700K delivered another enormous jump over the 9900K. I'm not sure whether it's the cache improvements or the core architectural improvement, but the single-threaded performance on offer allows the underlying Dunia engine to scale much more effectively than Skylake-based 9900Ks. Gears 5 and Unreal Engine 4 title showed another solid improvement from the 11700K. With an average of 345 FPS, the i7 stomps the 9900K, almost matching the maximum returned by the i9. Either way, both chips are beyond playable, but if we get down to the brass tacks, the 11700K does technically provide a measurable improvement. Grand Theft Auto V, a game built on the proprietary Rage engine, has a framerate cap and engine that seems to max out at around 180 FPS. Both our chips provided nearly identical performance, but the 11700K was technically the stronger performance by a very slim margin. It appears as if a Skylake chip is more than enough to run this game at insane frame rates, but an upgrade to the Cypress Cove chip wouldn't provide that much of an upgrade. Up next is Metro Exodus, and after a 10 minute gameplay session our i7-11700K pulled ahead by about 24%. This nearly matches Intel's own IPC uplift claims, which for the most part seems believable. The minimums on the i7 nearly match the average of the i9, really showing how impressive this chip can be when clocked at 5GHz all core. Overwatch was another strong performance for both our chips. And if I'm being honest, if you're looking to play this game, you could get by with a much cheaper and older quad-core part from Intel or AMD. This game is one of those games that you can run on a toaster, but I will say that the game runs smoothly absolutely maxed out on both our chips here as well. PUBG is up next, and the performance on offer from the 11700K is impressive. Coming in at around 17% faster on average than the 9900K, this is an impressive showing for the chip and once again nearly matches Intel's claim of a 20% IPC uplift with this generation of chip. PUBG is beyond stable on either chip though, and I would personally just buy whichever chip is cheaper. The classic game remastered, Quake came in with ridiculous frame rates on both the chips we're testing today, with nearly 2000 frames per second on the 11700K and just under 1900 on the 9900K. I'd say both are playable, and even with the minimum frame rates, both maintain nearly 1000 FPS at all times. Very impressive stuff coming in the form of both the 9900K and 11700K. Rainbow Six Siege shows another minor improvement in favor of the 11700K, 
With an average of about 400 FPS for both chips, it's hard to argue in favor of one over the other, especially given that the 9900K is probably cheaper now that Alder Lake is out. The i9 mysteriously came in with a higher minimum though, and after rerunning the benchmark a few more times, this was relatively consistent between all the runs. So it probably has something to do with a specific optimization or latency advantage in Skylake. Red Dead Redemption 2 is probably more GPU limited than CPU, as the benchmark run on both the chips returns similar results. The 11700K is technically better by a slim margin, but in gameplay it's probably not something you'll notice. For high refresh 1080p though, both these chips provide excellent performance in this particular game. Call of Duty Warzone is the final game on our test suite, and like Rainbow Six Siege, the Skylake based i9 provided an overall tighter grouping of frame rates, indicating more drops on the i7. This could be the latency issues with the cache rearing its ugly head, but more likely it could also be the game to game variance, as there is no benchmarking feature in Warzone. 200 FPS is still playable and I'd be happy playing on either chip. In conclusion, the Intel Core i7-11700K is an excellent gaming chip that gives the previous generation i9-9900K, and by extension the i7-10700K, a massive run for its money. Even though in some games the 9900K had a slight advantage in tighter frame rate groupings, both chips performed in similar classes, and for that it's an easy recommendation. I would like to mention real quickly the i5-11400, which I reviewed previously on my channel. It offers similar performance in games for a fraction of the price. Even the 11400F would be a good deal, especially since I've seen them on sale recently given the Alder Lake launch. This chip when compared to Alder Lake though isn't as positive. However, given that platform costs are coming down for the 11700K, it makes it a much easier pill to swallow as you don't need to spend money on DDR5 or the new and expensive LGA1700 boards. If you're comparing an i9-9900K and an i7-11700K in the hopes of finding your next gaming CPU, then I would just get whichever one is cheaper. But if you want the new instructions in PCI 4.0, then Rocket Lake and Alder Lake are the only options from Intel at the moment. Rocket Lake prices are also starting to come down, and in just the last week, the prices dropped by over $50 on most major retailers. Given time, I'm sure this chip will become more plentiful, and if you're able to find it for around the $300 mark, it's an absolute steal. If you're buying new, then paying $350 isn't that bad, just keep in mind some of the weaknesses of the chip.